at the time at the White House is so different than what it is now. This was before 9-11. You could literally walk from the press area through Lower Press and run into the president or up the colony. You could, you could run into them. You would have conversation. It's not like it is now. We've lost so much ground in contact with the president. When did you know that this was something that you wanted to do? Like, how did you get into covering the White House? Give us your path a little bit. Well, um, I took a different journey than many people and probably both of you. I started out in radio. I started as a DJ, believe it or not. Um, I knew I, w I know you're laughing, right? I w <laughs> wait, wait, were you like, were you like top, what were you, top 40? Were you pop, R&B? What are we talking Jazz, about? Jazz, R&B, um, April Ryan here, W-E-A-A, FM Sade, is it a crime <laughs> at 10 o'clock? Tune in. We've got more. Time. She still got that radio voice. Yeah, girl. You know, I just, <laughs> and you know who the crazy piece of it? Guess who was my first program director ever? Kwaisi and Fume, now Congressman Kwaisi and Fume. Um, he was a program director at Morgan State University. I was a freshman. And I I just felt something was missing. And I went back to what I started out with. My parents would always watch the news. I mean, listen to the news. My parents were ahead of their times. If, if there was a word called news junkies back then, they were that times a thousand. Um, they were very much about the community, about service to the community, about knowing what was going on. And I remember every night asking my dad, why are you watching the news? And he would say, now for the average person that would run, but I gravitated to it, he said, I want to see when the world comes to an end. You don't tell a child that. I'm saying that's kind of that's you know, that's yeah that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> but in his way, that was his way of trying to explain to me it was so important. And he mm. watched religiously the man who used to say that's the way it was. And I knew, I guess, I knew I wanted to be in it because there was such a love for information, radio and TV. But I thought I wanted to do to do music, be a DJ. But I wound up producing a news program. I wound up uh, anchoring. I wound up doing things in news and I fell into it. And it just, I fell into everything pretty much. I fell into the position at the White House. I was stringing every time I was around the country working or wherever station I worked for, whatever station I worked for, I would string news. And AURN said, look, we want to bring you in. And I said, okay. And they brought me in. I thought I was coming in as a DC bureau chief and I wound up being White House correspondent, and that was 23 years ago, and we're still counting. Uh, what about you, Yamisha? I mean, I see some similarities already because, at least from what I read, your parents were also people who served the community and were uh, into current events. So, um, what was your pathway? How did it lead you to the White House? Can I just start by saying I think this is so dope that I get to talk to you. <laughs> um, can we just start with the fact that Abra Ryan and Jamel Hill are here and Yamish just happens to be in this. I'm super, super <laughs> hyped to be here. Um, I'm like a little kid, like, yeah, I get to talk to people that I love. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> so I, I just want to say I, I, I admire both of you so much. I've been watching both of you so much. So it's just kind of amazing to be able to do this. Um, I was, D April was a DJ and I was a slam poet. Um, I was super into writing poetry and writing short stories and thought that I was going to somehow become a fiction writer and um, learned about the story of Emmett Till when I was in high school. And it, it shifted me completely. There was the moment before Emmett Till and the moment after Emmett Till. And for me, learning about civil rights journalism, reading about the stories, reading about what Jet Magazine meant to African Americans, what Ida B. Wells did for our people, I thought, okay, I definitely want to be a reporter. So I've been a street reporter. Um, I, my mom was a social worker and, and just retired. Mm. And my dad runs a large nonprofit in Haiti for disabled people. So I always had that kind of social justice gene. My parents are people who watch the news, listen to the news, understand um, politics very deeply because both of them at one point fled Haiti. Fled, they fled a dictator and, and met in Boston at Boston College when they were both um, essentially in exile from their homeland. So politics and news has always been something that's been interesting to me and 
I think for a while I was, I thought I was going to be kind of a street reporter who was a national breaking news reporter who was covering Black Lives Matter, covering police shootings. But then the 2016 um, campaign came around and I got recruited by the New York Times and they said, like, why don't you go cover this guy named Bernie Sanders and see how you like that? And I fell into political reporting. I remember laughing with my husband, my boyfriend at the time, thinking I've never covered politics and here I am covering it for the New York Times. Like, what is this? Um, And it was a dream come true. It was amazing. And it got me thinking and helped me understand how much politics has always been at the heart of civil rights in this country. That no matter what you do on the street, if you don't translate that into laws, into action, uh, into cultural shifts that start in a lot of times in legislation, that, that you can't really change the country. So after the 2016, campaign um, and President Trump winning, I knew that there was going to be a big story to cover about civil rights and politics. So I essentially willed my way to the White House thinking every day I wanted to be there. And luckily enough for me, PBS NewsHour um, picked me up and and made me a White House correspondent. Can either of you um, remember clearly the first time the president called on you um, when it was your time to ask a question? Which one? Um, well, I know. Okay, you, okay, okay, April. Okay, I don't know. April said the president. I'm like, are you talking about April? April? I'm sorry, not <laughs> well, this president. I would say. April. Well, you said I'm an OG. You said I'm an yes, OG. That is true. So for you, it would have been one president so, under my belt. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. And that president, your first president, will always be memorable. And this one, who will keep a lasting impression on us? But the first president for me was Bill Clinton, and I will never forget it. Um, When I came to Washington, I had a lot of people looking out for me. And my fairy godmother, if you will, one of them happened to be the late Alma Brown, the wife of the late head of the Democratic National Committee, Ron Brown. And she said, you know, Washington power is when the president calls you by name, your calls will be answered. I'm like, what? I'm like, what is she saying? Then my cousin, um, Congressman Ed Towns, his wife said, you know, Washington power is when the president calls you. But I'm like, what is up with this Washington power? So I didn't just want Bill Clinton to call me, say, yes, you over there. He had to call me by name. So <laughs> at the time at the White House, it's so different than what it is now. This was before 9-11. You could literally walk from the press area through lower press and run into the president or up the colony. You could, you could run into them. You would have conversation. It's not like it is now. We've lost so much ground in contact with the president. And I remember running into him the first time and he didn't know me. I didn't know him. I was like, hello, sir. My name is April. I'm part of the press. He's going to leave. I said, no, 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 don't leave. I said, I'm the newest member. I'm for American Urban Radio Networks. Please call on me. My name is April Ryan. So he did, he didn't call on me the first press conference after I got there, but it was the second one and he didn't call me by name. And I told Mike McCurry, I said, look, what's up with that? And so when I saw the president again, I said, sir, will you call me by name? And he went to Mike McCurry and said, what's up with her wanting me to call her by name? So <laughs> that's how it all started. Um, but it's, it's a different day and you, it's a different, it's a very different day and how you relate to the president but there is still such interaction because we are still in a, such a small place. You don't get a chance to really personally know them as much, I guess, when you fly on Air Force One and, and you travel with them on Air Force One and when you're in the pool somewhat, but it used to be you, get, you got to know the president a little bit more in a personal setting versus now. And that kind of contributed to him calling on me um, at that time. So, so do you remember the question you asked him, the first one? Hosni Mubarak was my first question. Hosni Mubarak was the president of uh, Egypt at the time. And I was like, ooh. So I said, wait a minute. Um, he called on me, but I forgot the question. I forgot the question. I can look it up. But it is all your oh, questions. Okay, yeah. All your questions are always, I know, but all your questions, that was like 23 years ago. I don't even remember what happened yesterday. So, look, <laughs> so all your questions are on official transcript it's part of the archives so if i look it up i can find it but i forgot <laughs> now what about you Yvish? what was it 
I can't remember the first time that President Trump called on me because, um, as April said, there's a lot of things that are that are different now. So I want to say that the first time that I that he ever took a question from me was on the the lawn of the White House when he was walking um, to the helicopter, and I was probably screaming something about, "Did you tell the truth about something? Or is there something having to do with the latest news cycle? Since there are so many, so I can't remember the first question. I can remember the first memorable moment, and that was when in November 2018 I asked him whether or not um, he had anything to say about people thinking that he was emboldening white nationalists by calling himself a nationalist. And I remember him then calling my question racist. And I remember that being a moment where I, I recognized what it meant to be questioning the president in that way and for the president to kind of be lashing out at you and what that what that would entail. Um, so I, I remember that being the, the, the most memorable moment that I've ever been called on in a press conference. I'm not sure if he had called on me before in a press conference, but I venture to say that that was one of the first times that he called on me at a press conference. But you know, yeah, um, and, Jamil, but no, go ahead, your Mish is right. There is a difference. This president now, the way he deals with the media you know, the press gathering would be as he was walking to the helicopter versus being in the East Room or being an oval. So it's a different type of dynamic how this president handles the press. And Yamish, you're right. I remember that press conference. That's the time that he told me to sit down. And, and you know, that that press conference was off the chain. That's all I can say. When <laughs> it was a little that, wild. It, it was off the chain. Let's just say it. Because when he said that, I was like, and then when he said that to me, it was like, you know, sit down. I was like, but you responded to my thing. And then the next day he was talking about, I'm a loser and I'm nasty. I was like, and then talking about CNN. I said, what is he doing in my money? I said, why doesn't he rele release his taxes instead of talking about my money? What have I done? I don't work for the government. But that was, that press conference was off the rails. And, um, it was, I remember it like it was yesterday. You know? And you I could remember. tell he was mad because a lot of it had to do with the fact that they had won so badly in the midterms. Um, Democrats had retaken the House. So there was this feeling that he was already in this bad mood, um, pacing at times. He had he had got into it with Jim Acosta that day. So That's when right. you cover President Trump, especially, you get to know his moods and get to know when things have really um, gotten into a place where he's feeling bad. And that press conference, I remember thinking to myself, I think that he's really, really upset. I think that he's 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 stewing on the idea um, that he is now attached to these losses um, that have to do with the House of Representatives. And that was the day that Jim Acosta was accused of touching an intern when he did it. That propaganda video, and um, it was like I said, that press conference was off the rails. And Yamish is right. You watch a president's body language. That's a part of your reporting. His mood what he says, how he delivers it. And that tells you because it tells you where his mind is. But with this president, it's a little different. Well, no, it's a lot different than other presidents. I mean, this is just, this president and, and how we cover it is so different. This is, this presidency and the way we cover it is a polar opposite of the last three presidents that I've covered. It's, it's, it's two extremes.